engine repair test 1516 starts now. Do not disable any cylinder for long periods of time because damage to the catalytic converter can result. Yes. Now, newer engines will turn off the injector on that cylinder as soon as they detect it. Misfiring, and I say newer, I've seen it as early as 95. So, you know, but it's just never, it's always the best, a good bet not to let a lot of raw gas go into the, if you're going to disable a cylinder, you can actually, if you can unplug the injector, it's better. But on some of these motors, you can't get to the doggone injector, or you can't get to all of them, you get to some of them. You know, try getting to one on that little uh, 3.1 in these GM cars, that's buried under the intake. You can get down to them thing. Spark plug should be replaced only as needed. False. False. A cranking compression test is the best way to test the valve train action. Pretty doggone good. Number four, compression testing can help the technician detect mechanical faults in the engine. All right, you remember that little story I told about the gas burning ton and a half truck that I worked on that time back in 1985? Comes in here and it's skipping on front cylinder on the right bank, which is one on that motor. I believe. It's a. It was a Ford. No, it was a 304. Um, may have that may have been. That's international. But it, I mean, no, I'm sorry, it was a front cylinder left bank. It was one because it was like a GM, but it, it was a front cylinder right bank. Which, whatever it was, I remember standing there working on it. And uh, so I checked the compression. It's got no compression on that skipping cylinder. None. Oh, that's the one you come up with that. I put oil in there. You put oil in there to see if it rings your valve, right? Mm -hmm. Got it? Put oil in there, the compression comes up to 180 pounds. Conventional wisdom says that's rings, right? Yeah. But it shouldn't go from zero to 180. That seemed like a big spread to me. Usually it'll have like 60 pounds. The rest of them will have like 140. It'll have 60 pounds. And you check the compression and put oil in there and, you know, let it mix around. Then you check it again and it's up to about 110. Well, it went up significantly when I put oil in it, so that means that the rings ain't seated and maybe got broke rings, something like that. So this particular one here come up to 180 pounds. And so I went and told, I went off half cocked and went and told the guy that was running the place. I said, oh, it looks like we got ring problems with this thing, you know, because no compression comes up to 180. So he calls and they say, well, it's been five years since we've had that truck rebuilt because it belonged to a lumber yard. And they say, let's go ahead and build it. And so I said, well, the end frame over all the time, you know. So I, when I pull that valve cover off, one of the push rods was out of place laying down in the valley. Now, how did that do that? When I put that push rod back in place, it had good compression on the cylinder ran just fine. How? So, I'll tell you how. If you've got this, what you were talking about earlier, the vacuum, the vacuum can be strong enough if you've got good healthy rings and all, that when you put oil in there and it seals really good, it can pull that valve open. The atmospheric pressure can open that valve. Oh, so it pulled and the it, valve. Pulled, it pulled the valve open, pulled air in there, and then it squeezed it. That's how that works. It can pull that valve open. You know, I mean, and you can, it can make that happen. Now, uh, something else that happens, uh, and this is, in, you know, engine dynamics and all, and we're in engine repair too. The, if you've got cow, cam time in advance so that the intake valve closes too soon, right? You got that? All right. Now, what is that going to do? It closes too soon while you're still coming down. It hasn't had a chance. And then you wind up with a sort of a vacuum spike in every single cylinder. Now, what does that do? It pulls all past the rings up into the cylinder, which if you're doing a perpetual wet test. What you find out then is you've got really high compression, higher than you ever ought to have. And furthermore, the darn thing's smoking. It can be one tooth off on the cam jet and cause that. Honda cars do that. You know, I've not told you about that guy looking at vacuum weave well, form. Huh? Well, you just turn it back, line it back up. So yeah, that's all you got to do. Yeah. I yeah. that's what's going on with Yeah, if it's one tooth off, they'll make it smoke. Because it don't, it's sitting still, it don't smoke. You give it gas, it smoke. Yeah, if you're doing, um, I mean, does it have really, what's the compression on it and all that? You like 195 pounds. Yeah. It's supposed to have around there. Though. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, so too. You know, that other time I was telling you about that Taurus that when you crank it up, it was 89 Taurus. We didn't even have any 89 Tauruses on the lot yet, but it came from a rental car place. And uh, it had a three liter in it, just like that one right there. 
and I was uh, trying to figure out why this silly thing. You crank it up, you barely could keep it alive when it was cold. But if you ever could manage to feather the gas and keep it alive, uh, that thing had it run like a spotted ape. Boy, it was just a, it was a stud. And when it idled, a little bit of smoke would come out of it. Uh, and it would labor knock a little bit when you're driving down the road. And so I checked the compression. It was 210 pounds per cylinder, but it's supposed to be 160. And it turned out that one had diesel in it. And that diesel was keeping the piston rings really good and wet, <laughs> you know, so they were sealing better, raising the compression. And uh, it was the raised compression was causing a ping, and that little bit of white smoke was that diesel that wasn't combusting, you know, like gasoline would, and it was just white smoking out the exhaust. I was holding a shop for him, and I says, this thing's got, even across the board, 210 pounds of compression. He said, well, my guy's got that. Said, Come on, Philip. It's got 50 pounds more on every cylinder. What's up, what's up with this, you know? And this was a, a car that didn't have 1,800 miles on it. Well, some yo-yo that rented it pulled up to the gas pump. I don't know how much gas he needed to put in there, but he somehow managed, he managed to get diesel into that sucker. And uh, the fact that it still runs. What was funny about that, I told you that when I told David Buck about that, he wouldn't put a bunch of diesel in his truck. Try to make it run better. <laughs> well, he didn't get the mixture right. All they would make it run worse, you know. But you can't say any time I put diesel in my car, it's going to run better. The mix has got to be exactly right, and it's all going to cause a little trouble. You know, most of the time it's foul, foul the plugs when you try to start it, and it's all kinds of issues, you know. But uh, it, it, did, did you just shouldn't do it. Yeah, I know it. It's just not a good plan. But that particular one, I was impressed with how that thing would. It would just absolutely fly, and. Uh, now, newer platinum spark plugs have a high failure rate when they're used for more than how many miles? 30, 30. Actually, 50,000 miles. But let me tell you something about spark plugs. Um, I have routinely, when I was working at Ford dealership, I've seen F-150s and vans with like 302s and stuff come in, and they'd have plain old copper spark plugs in them from the factory. You can tell when it's the spark plugs that came in there because they have a paint spot on top of the spark plug. Yep. I mean, typically, if it's got a paint spot, that one there's kind of got one, but a paint spot on top of the plug, it'll typically be the one that came in there. And that, uh, I've seen them go 110,000 miles with plain old copper spark plug. You know, but what's wrong with, the, what's wrong with, you know, for a long time, years I, without thinking about it, I always figure, well, as long as it's running okay, why don't you just leave the spark plugs alone? But that ain't a good idea because the resistance goes up, 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 up. And eventually the spark plug gets where they're too hard to fire and that spark starts hunting somewhere else to go. And then you've got other ignition components that fail because you've overworked them. So it's better to follow your owner's manual. If they say to change, I'm, I'm a tremendous believer. If the owner's manual, if I'm driving a vehicle, most of my vehicles have been newer ones in the last several years. I mean, you know, before I got married to my wife, I would always drive by just junk bomb jury rig cars. And, you know, after I got married to her in 1992, that's, forget it, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to drive nice cars. I'm like, Arr, Arr. So anyway, uh, I always make sure that I change the oil and the transmission fluid and the coolant and the spark plugs and everything according to what the manufacturer said. Because I'm not smarter than the manufacturer. You got that? I mean, so I'm going to change this stuff regular. I don't know about that. Manufacturing takes stuff sometimes. Well, like a Chrysler. I couldn't manufacture anything. But the fact is, you got to what you got to do if you if you follow that manual. That car's got no reason to be breaking down, you know, unless there's some defects. How you train transmission fluid in the standard? Yeah, you actually got a drain plug on standard. I'm not my you, got you got a drain plug on there, some, and you just break that plug loose, and it comes out, and then you put it back in, and you take the, the fill plug out, and you fill it up to where it's up with the right kind of fluid. You better find out what goes in there, because... It can be anything from automatic transmission fluid to 75 weight gear grease, you know, 75. 89. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, but some automatic transmission fluid work gear. Pretty much. It works. It works. Yeah. Oh, well, some transmissions some transmissions use automatic transmission fluid, huh? So pretty much it'd be like a Ford Explorer. Mm-hmm. The chunk and the, uh, to that way. I have one of my friends. He's a, he, uh, sorry to say, he, he put automatic, he put oil in this transmission well, you can put 50 weight motor oil in it. No, yeah, it's regular. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably better than not having any oil in it at all. You know. But if you put oil in there, it's too thick. It will it'll cause gear clash. I found that out hard way one time. Rebuilt a little Toyota transmission in a, in a Toyota car, and I opened it up. And the Toyota transmission is pretty good because it opens up like a suitcase. You take all these 12 meter bolts off, you open it up, and there's your gear. It's the neatest thing in the world. Well, I put that thing back together and I replaced whatever was bad in it. And 
all I had was some 140 weight gear oil I could put in the rear end. I put some of that in there and it couldn't drive that thing for nothing. Grrr, grinding the gear. And I thought it has to be that oil I put in there. So I got that out of there and got some more oil and took care of it. Automatic. I don't see how he did it because oil is this bit around Oh, I see what you're saying. He put the, he put the, he put oil, motor oil and automatic transmission. Oh, no. Yeah, that is a big problem there. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nope. Locked up. Yep. Well, it probably wiped out all the seals and swelled them up and everything else. Okay, let's look at this. Let's does buzz on down to number. If the engine's running poorly and a technician has his spark plugged out, it may be wise to perform what kind of a test? Compression. That's on number six, right? That's the compression test, yep. Now, when you perform a compression test, the right way to do that, and most all of us, if up. all the plugs out, hold a gas pedal on the floor, you're wanting to disable the fuel system, but you also want to get all the air it can. That's the right way to do a compression test. Hold a gas pedal on the floor, pull all the plugs out. Now, everybody that has ever worked on very many cars, if they've got a cylinder that they suspect has low compression, they're subject to just jerk that one plug out and jack compression out one cylinder. You can do that and get away with it. But if you're going to do it right and get good hard numbers you know, on the whole engine, on the whole engine cell, you need to drop all, pull all the plugs out. You don't pull one plug out, check the compression on that one, put that plug back, pull the next plug out. You know, you pull them all out. That's the way you're supposed to do that. Who did that? Somebody do that? <laughs> He's looking around. Hey, by the way, you guys, I want that uh, engine sitting in that crown big today and bolt it up. Y'all knew that, can't you? Possibly. Buckle it, <laughs> buckle it together, swing it in there. It won't take you that long once you, once you get it in place. Don't. Make it be hard, hard, that yeah, just make it happen, guys. I want that. I need to get that thing off that lift and we've worked on it too long anyway. And I want to hear it run. This you know, but it's going to run a lot better when y'all get through with it if you got it in time like it's supposed to be. Oh, on the other hand. Yep. And it, I hope it's got some engine vacuum in. Number eight. Excuse me, number seven. Technician A says when a spark plug is caked with oil deposits, it's usually caused by worn piston rings or valve seals. Technician B says nothing can be determined from a visual inspection of the spark plugs. Oh, my God. What a yo-yo, number seven. Now, I will tell you that if you see it, you look over behind you up there, uh, Mr. Stokes. Look back up there. See that? Spark plug right there. See the ice cream, puffy brown ice cream stuff? On my Technical Rider Facebook page, I've got a uh, really good photograph I took of one that we pulled out of an engine out here like that. That is from valve stem seals. When you see a spark plug that has them puffy brown ice cream looking deposits on it, it can cause random misfires, it can cause a surge, it can cause all kinds of stuff, and that is a valve stem seal problem. If you put another set of spark plugs in there, they're going to come out looking like that too. How fast they come out of there looking like that may be debatable. It may take a year for them to get back like that again. But that is because they get little deposits and they burn those off when they crank it up and they start to build up. And it turns into that ice cream looking stuff. Okay, which one are we on? Uh, no, eight. A spark plug that's been running in an excessively wow. rich fuel environment will yeah, tend to have what? Black. It's going to be sooty and black. If it's not firing all, it's going to be sooty, black, and wet. So if you pull one out and it's sooty, black, and wet, first thing I always like to do is screw another spark plug in there and just see if that one hits. And a lot of times it will. Uh, number 10. Excuse me, number 9. Technician A says a cranking compression test is the most commonly used type of compression test. Well, really? Really? Uh, technician B says a running compression test is the most commonly used type of yeah, most of the time you're going to spin it over. All right, but uh, you can a running compression test is only going to show about 60 psi of compression. The cranking was where you're going to get your biggest number. So yeah, that's going to be a nine, huh? It's going to be a nine. It's going to be nine. He's the, the uh, cranking compression test. Hey, I've tried to trip you guys up so you can call me down. You know, uh, when performing a cranking compression test, the technician should crank the engine over what? How many? Five. It says five. I like to go six, okay? Six puffs. I want six puffs. Somebody was helping with a compression test the other day, and I'd say, okay, spin it over. And they go, whoa, whoa. I said, no, more than that, you know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. I want to hear six puffs on here. That was on that neon, wasn't it? Well, there he is. All right, number 11. The final compression reading should be close to the specification. And be within what? You know what I'm saying? The final compression reading should be close to the specs and be within 20% of each other, right? 
And what does that mean exactly? How does Miss Goosby need to teach you math so you can do this? Right? Between 20% of each other. Okay, this is my compression readings here. I got 140, I got 130, I got 150, I got 160. Are those okay? No. Okay, what is 20% uh, of each other mean? Plus 20% of 160. Huh? Plus 20% of 100. 20, so 20% 20 of 160. What's a fifth of 160? Yeah, what's a fifth? How many will you do? What's 5 into 160? What's 5 into 150? 30. 30. Okay, so it's going to be 32. Okay, so 20% of this is going to be 32, right? Okay, so is this one here within 20% of that one? No. See, so your highest one's the one you're going to use your number. Well, wait a minute, 32. Why are we hurting my brain? It barely is, right? It barely is. So that right there, I don't really like this all that much. I'll tell you something that happened one day. This guy working next, right across from me there, he had an uh, engine that was skipping on number five. And when he checked the compression, it was 160 on every cylinder. On that one, it was 125. Well, what happened, what the, how it originally started, he put a spark plug in it because the spark plug was just destroyed like you'd hit it with a blowtorch. I mean, it was really just burned up. So he put another plug in it. And it came back the next day the same way, like a blowtorch got it. And so when he checked the compression, the 125 pounds, the, um, that cylinder had been running super, super, super hot because the intake valve was leaking. It was pulling air in there. That didn't belong. It was, it was running lean, you see, because of that. And that lean running, plus that air going in there when everything was already hot, was just like a torch burning that plug up, the way the valve was burned. It was a dynamic to the way the valve, the way that fresh air was coming. In other words, the valve was burned right there pointing at the spark plug. <laughs> and so when it when it did that, so. But it also was causing that cylinder to run super, super hot. So they took it on the other side of the shelf over there, and they uh, put the valve job on it. Put it all back together with new plugs and everything. It was still skipping on that same cylinder. But the compression was good. Still skipping on the same cylinder. Compression is good. All we had to do to straighten it out was clean the injector. That particular injector got really, really hot. And it got some deposits in there that got cooked onto this little pendle. And that's what the problem was with it. See, the, the injector was stopped up with little, back in those days, they were putting olefin particles in the fuel to try to clean the injectors. But when it would get trapped in there on a really hot injector, it would seriously bake those things to that pintle. And it would eventually they built up to where they clogged it up and it wasn't hurling. Wasn't getting enough fuel on that one. You could have replaced that injector, none of it. We cleaned them and took care of it. Um, there was a Buick that came in here one time and um, they said, uh, Can you do this? A, uh, they had thought it was a blown head gasket or something like that. I don't remember what it was. They thought it was something major because the shop somewhere had told them it was something major. And it was skipping on one cylinder, da, 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 like that. And I said, well, before we do all of that, why don't we just clean the injector? Just because. Because I really didn't appeal. It didn't seem to me to have that problem they were talking about with our, when we did our diagnostics. And when we ran the injector cleaner through it, took care of it. Smooth the silk. And, um, and of course, we went in and put a thermostat on everything, too. But the, the long and short of that is, listen to this, fellas. When you do an engine repair... If you suspect that you may have a blown head gasket, but it may be the thermostat, let's do a thermostat first. How much does a thermostat cost? You buy one nowadays at 3 or $4, put a thermostat, put a gasket in there, maybe a little bit of a trouble to get to it. Now on that dadgum Saturn that Chelsea worked on, you got to pull the intake off and get the stupid thermostat. It's a pain. But anyway, if it's, most of the time, thermostat's fairly easy to change. On. But nowadays, they got the thing you put on there, turn it on, crank it up, and if there's any kind of, what is it? Uh, the gas is in the exhaust system. Yeah. yeah, it'll change the color of that water. Yeah, Real quick. yeah, and that's a that's a pretty good test. Yeah, it does all right on that. Um, we've actually uh, that's been around for eons. I mean, absolutely eons. They were using that, you know, at the Ford dealership where I worked long years ago. They had one of them things there, but uh, but they only used it in extreme circumstances, you know. But if you can get hydrocarbons out of there, you know, you definitely know there's issues. I tell you what, I have seen though. You know, whenever you crank one up and uh, 
sometimes you don't even have to know if our hydrocarbons in there. This one guy got his escort really hot, and whenever we spun it over, you know, the, the angle, they try to angle the radiator neck. Um, sometimes it looks like away from whoever is going to be putting the stuff in it, so in case they ever open the cap, it won't wet them too bad. But that one there was pointing back toward the windshield, and when we spun it over, that uh, coolant came out of the radiator like a fire hose and went all over the windshield just when we spun it over because it, the head gas get blown so bad. I mean, yeah. That's that engine we got on the stand out here, come out of 98 Escort. Well, the, uh, sometimes you will see one act, and you would swear it had a blown head gasket just because of the way the, the when it's running, the, the water starts geysering out of the radiator and puking and everything, and you think, oh, that's a blown head gasket. Well, typically, when you've got a blown head gasket, it will smell a certain way. If you smell that, it's a stinking sweet smell. Mm-hmm. You can smell this sickly sweet smell that's come. This the little the steam and stuff coming out of the radiator will have the smell of a blown head gasket. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Well, now the Oldsmobile ain't got a blown head gasket, but the uh, that fan is bad on it. I'm supposed to it have it here. Over, yeah. It. Well, it was blowing over because it was overheating, but it didn't. If it did blow a head gasket, I'll let you take care of that. But anyway, what the deal here is, uh, if you take your, and this is something else I'm going to tell you about this, if you take the, what we did for years, I learned this at the filling station in the mid-70s, you take a, if you suspect one's got a blown head gasket on it, and you put the radiator cap on it, and you crank it up and you let it run, and this got to be when it's in there cold, when it ain't been started all day. You put the radiator cap on good and tight, make sure it's full of water, crank it up, let it run for about 60 seconds. I mean, like a full minute. Shut it off, pull the cap off. If there's pressure there, you got a blown head gasket. In other words, and head gaskets can blow a lot of ways. They don't always put pressure in the coolant system. Sometimes, like on my Jeep, coolant weeps into the cylinder and wets the spark plug, see? Now, that one never got any pressure in the coolant system, you know, except for what was there ordinarily. So, anyway, be aware of that. Now, let's move on here. Uh, uh, West turns into a skeleton over. Two adjacent cylinders with low compression readings may indicate what? What I tell you? What I tell you? Sean? Two adjacent cylinders, the head gasket blown in between. You see on that picture right over there? Wait a minute. Well, they do have that, but it's hard to see. On that roll gasket chart right there, uh, you'll see one blown between two cylinders. And that thing around the end of that, around that gasket is called a fire ring, you know? And it has, it has to handle a lot of stress. Number 12. Okay, so that's actually going to be number C is a head gasket blown between two cylinders. 13. When performing a power balance test, cylinders that drop how many RPM? 50 RPM or less than the other cylinders should be analyzed. Now, the, uh, you know, the IDS, the uh, Forge Diagnostic Tool, has got a really cool uh, way to check that. They got a little uh, track on a screen, and whenever you're dropping, uh, a cylinder that one you'll have a little V there where that RPM drop was. Mm-hmm. And the two types of power balance tests are what an automatic, right. manual automatic. Remember that little handout I gave you about that uh, Mustang that they were working on? Donnie kept getting a misfire code on it on P0302 whatever, and so he really couldn't feel it misfiring or nothing and all that. So, we, uh, but he put the, I uh, mean that code kept coming back. So he put that IDS on it. And number two had like a 40 RPM drop every time it fired. And so uh, he checked the compression, and the compression was, this is interesting, it had a 40 RPM drop, but it also had 40 pounds less than the other shoulders. And so they pull the head off, and whenever uh, the guy that was working on it, Marty, he turned it through, and that cylinder came up and it started going down. It was a quarter of an inch lower than all the other cylinders. And it had a, so they had ingested some water at some point, apparently, and bent the rod just a little bit. Now, you couldn't feel nothing. I mean, if you'd have been driving it and you didn't have OBD2 that was looking for misfires, you'd never know that thing had a problem. I mean, it wasn't using oil on that cylinder, it wasn't anything else, but it had a 40 RPM drop on that one cylinder. And it was a beautifully bent rod, you know, it was just perfect. You know, but it was a quarter of an inch less, that was 40 pounds worth of compression, a quarter of an inch less travel. You know, I mean, in other words, it was quarter of an inch lower all the way down. All right, number 15. When a problem with a component or a system is detected, a diagnostic trouble code can be set. That is not a, that's a no-brainer. 16. Spark plug blink can help the technician identify and pinpoint mechanical problems. Deposits. You look at a spark plug, you're going to know something, right? Um, number 17. To help determine the cause of a weak cylinder, 
uh, technician will perform a wet compression test. Wet compression. That's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, if one or more cylinders are below specifications, it's likely caused by worn what? Rings. Rings. But you know, you can have valves causing that too. Uh, to be to prevent contamination of engine oil, the technician should disable what? Fuel. The fuel system. You take care. To, you know, take it loose. Uh, kill your fuel pump. Right. If all the cylinders are near zero, the technician should suspect improper <laughs> valve timing. That's right. Valve timing. Okay, now then, I want to talk about, just for briefly, and we'll show you these guys this worksheet on this one here. And, um,